Okay, so the next keynote will be given by Mohammed Rastagiri. Mohammed is a current uh, senior AI ML uh, technical lead at Apple. Previously, he was the co-founder and CTO of Xnode.ai, which was acquired by Apple. And uh, Mohammed will talk about data-free neural network compression. Please go ahead, Mohammed. Thank you. So um, thank you for having me here today. Um, so I'm going to talk about a topic um, that has not been uh, really um, approached in the uh, past uh, few years. And uh, um, there has a lot of value um, on, on, on compression that we all understood. So let's get a look back on uh, why uh, we um, come to a neural network compression. So by now, all of us uh, know already that, um, hey, you know, expensive neural network models, such as like traditional convolutional neural networks, um, in order for them to work in practice, we need to resort to some sort of uh, cloud computings, uh, which we all know they come with cost. And so during these past few years, um, there have been a lot of research to enabling building um, efficient uh, inference ML and AI techniques, especially in, in convolutional neural network in general, um, such as like quantization, pruning, uh, and efficient neural network architecture. So by all of these basically techniques, we what we are enabling is that we can now run our like models uh, on device without the need of any sort of cloud computing. And that's for the reason that like all of these events such as TinyML, um, AJIML, and all of those things have been um, around this, this topic. And we see like there is a big and huge uh, motivation and movement in AI around this topic in past few years. But um, are we done? And, and uh, is there any other complication yet around this topic in general in high level? I would say that, yeah, there are some complications here. Um, so if you um, if you look at like, you know, the current um, compression techniques, they are like very different from, uh, let's say, um, image compression techniques or any sort of like, other data compression techniques that we uh, had uh, in, in, in other domains, such as in database domains. So uh, like usually for uh, compressing a neural network, we still require uh, to retrain by uh, the original data that uh, the neural network was trained on. So, and that's kind of a big blocker here for us. Uh, for, for, for multiple reasons. One is that the original data may not be really available to us when we are playing the role as a, um, a compression um, a module here. So let's say because, you know, this is just could be usually a third party model that is given to us to, to, to compress. And now the data that those third party are working with may have a lot of uh, reason that we can cannot be shared with us, like for privacy reason or some specific legal uh, requirement, such as personal identifiable uh, information in the data should be there. And then we may not have access to those type of uh, data to train the model with. And not only that, we cannot always also let's say imagine that if we say that oh we can gather the data ourselves and then compress the model with that but this is, may not be always possible sometimes um, um training or like gathering the data may require some specialized hardware imagine that uh, we're working maybe with a some sort of like a specialized camera that or some sort of like ima ima imaging technique like in the medical imaging that uh, there's some specific type of uh, image settings that it's not very easy for a like uh, a third party that who compress the neural network and access uh, to those type of technology to collect these type of data so these all are making it like very challenging for like the current compression techniques to actually uh, effectively work in reality as like a standalone compression. Right now, compression has to be done by the folks who are doing the training themselves. Uh, okay, so um, then the question is that okay, how how can we compress a neural network without any training data? Um, so that's 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 that, that's that's basically a big topic that um, that's still uh, we a lot of a lot of gap exists with the current research and this topic here. So 
Um, we know that generative models, they can generate um, data. And then based on this, we may be able to devise a naive approach uh, for um, compressing a neural network without uh, any training data is given to us as a, let's say, um, a, a compression guy here to play the role. So let's say that uh, we first maybe sample a random, given a network, we sample a random output feature for that network. And let's say there is a magic uh, generator that given the output, random output can generate the input for us. And then we basically repeat these two um, to many times to basically collect a data set for the network that we have. And at the end, what we do is that we train a compressed version of that network using the collected data that we collected in the fashion that I just described above. But let's see, there are a caveat with this approach. Uh, there are major problems actually here. So first, there is not um, such a techniques that can actually generate uh, input image for any network in an unconstrained uh, um, assumptions, meaning that either we need to assume that the network is uh, in a specific type of domain, for example, a natural uh, in image, then we can put some sort of um, regularization or some sort of prior knowledge there that, hey, these are natural images, for example, like a smoothing and these uh, this kind of regularization or this kind of like prior uh, would help us to actually generate some sort of maybe meaningful images there, uh, or um, or it's it is you know if we have if if you're dealing with a small uh, network then maybe we are able to like generate the input because now the uh, the space is too small that we can control the domain. But given what we have in current uh, neural networks. Uh, it is it is almost impossible to generate some meaningful data here, and then um, the step the last step to train also the neural network using uh, this like random set of data. Uh, we uh, we know that you know this these neural networks are like super high dimensional, and in order just to be able to train them, you need to make sure that you are able to collect a massive set of data for that in a random way, and all of those data has to be meaningful. So most likely. What will happen is that because of these are like so super high dimension, we will end up training a random distribution uh, on, around that network rather than actually training the data that uh, uh, the network is, uh, is is basically purposed for that uh, type of uh, distribution. So we may end up to having the training the wrong part of the distribution of that huge space because uh, we are randomly choosing those uh, uh, those data. So. We cannot we cannot make any assumption about the distribution data. Uh, we we should basically uh, be uh, invariant toward that and actually uh, figure out what is that distribution during the compression. So these are seems like a major major challenge that we cannot we cannot tackle easily. So uh, for that uh, we started to think about an approach we call it a you know, layer wise data free uh, compression model. So basically, this way we want to confine the problem to some like a smaller problem. So we want to see the neural network as a bunch of a smaller layer, and then we uh, treat the, our problem based on the foundation of a teacher-student structure, where you know the original networks uh, will be a teacher network, and then we say that okay, let's the compressed network and the small network be a student network, and then um, in terms of the structure of the layers. We assume that there are a similar number of the layers, but each layer we want to uh, compress it either with a pruning technique or a quantization technique. So and then now we are dealing with a uh, like smaller problem here. Each layer is our, 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 our basically uh, building block. We can treat them as a, a, a separate network by itself, which are much smaller. And now we want to say that, okay, given that, uh, can we optimize each layer, meaning that now can we generate the data for each layer separately? And then the model optimization should optimize the student layer to match the output of the uh, teacher layer, which is our original network, while it being um, basically compressed. So uh, in this way, um, we kind of um, assure ourselves that now we are dealing with a much lower dimensional space and we basically 
the uh, extreme uh, simplification scenario will be uh, the, the student or the, each layer, they have like one, let's say, linear transformation, where, which is basically a one um, dot product. And now we know that uh, the space uh, of that uh, linear transformations can be easily modeled or the distribution of the data or around that hyper, uh, uh, hyper classifier or like hyper linear classifier that is actually representing the space. So basically the line that's the separator of the line of data space is, is the representation of the data by itself. So we can generate data based on that. So now, but we have in, in, in standard neural network designs, we have much more than that. So if you look at the standard neural network design, uh, we usually have a convolutional layer followed by a batch, sort of batch norm uh, uh, layer and with some activation. So there's an interesting point here. Um, so we already mentioned that it's much one layer, it's, it's already smaller, but now we want to see that how we can deal with the uh, distribution, the assumption about the distribution of the data that yet we are not um, randomly sampling from a wrong distribution. So um, there is a beauty in, in, in standard neural network that the, with their normalization uh, layer that they have in, in, each, uh, in each layer, basically. Um, this normalization um, um, step, they, uh, what they do is they, they are they're basically modeling the distribution of the data. Yeah? And then what they carry over they carry the uh, mean and variance of the distribution of the current layer and the layer that they're gonna pass to the data to. So if you look at here in this formulation of batch normalization, alpha and beta, they, they basically carry the mean and variance of the data that is going to be passed to the activation and they will go to the next layer. So what we can do for each layer, basically we can look at the batch norm of the previous layer and then get this uh, distribution information, mean and variance, and simply build a normal distribution around this, and then apply our activation, and then sample the data from this distribution. So this will give a meaningful data for that specific layer. So then now we can start basically uh, building the simple algorithm around this to uh, train that, that single layer. So the algorithm is basically very simple. We can clone the teacher to student as an initialization point, and then let's um, record just the batch norm statistic. Uh, I will mention why we need to record that in next slides. Um, then simply optimize for each uh, layer to match the output of the teacher layer. So um, it seems okay, but there are problems. So there are still problems here. Um, the, in order to understand this problem, we need to understand the core idea behind most of the quantization or pruning-based compression techniques here. So the core idea behind all of this uh, uh, quantization or the compression approach are that they look at the absolute values of the parameters or the weight filters, um, usually based on uh, the, the pruning models, like the main assumptions are usually that, hey, you know, when we have some low absolute value, then uh, those type of ways based on the percentage, based on the L1 norms or many, many other optimization uh, objectives, we prune out the uh, weight values that their absolute value are small. And then same, same goes with quantization. Uh, based on the absolute values of the weights, they will end up in different quantized buckets. Uh, uh, of, of, of the approach. For example, if you're doing like, uh, one bit uh, quantization, then you have two buckets. And then uh, we, we need to follow the, the weights in either of those two buckets based on their absolute values, actually. So then uh, this, this makes it actually um, now for us to pay a closer look to what we're doing when, when we are um, uh, working with uh, this type of like, normalization and sampling to, with this distribution. Let's look at let's look at like again the batch norm uh, formulation and see that uh, what what does it mean. So um, if we, if you're looking at the formulation, uh, it has basically a, simply a, 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 a you know we have a bunch of weight values that we apply on onto our input, which are like the x here, and then uh, then what we do is that we basically adjust the distribution based on the parameters that is given to us. And now imagine that if I have a scale factor, an arbitrary scale factor, 
I can simply uh, multiply it to my weight values and all the parameters, and there somewhere uh, into my distribution parameters, I can multiply by the inverse of that value. And then by this, uh, the out input and outputs will remain the same, but what happened is, is that I would end up having completely different weights in, in different scales. So it means that the, uh, the current formulations of neural networks are kind of independent of the actual scale of the um, weight values. They could have any scale of the weight values uh, that would uh, with the same output. So uh, I, may, I may have a neural network that the weight values are small, but however, I have a distribution parameters that can compensate for that. So if I prune that, uh, I may actually ruin the information uh, in, in, my, uh, in my neural network. So I need to somehow take care of that and make sure that these are um, these are not happening. They basically these these two need to be kind of merged. They cannot be separated. Then the distribution and the weight value has to be merged together. They they, they should not be um, separate from each other to compensate the error uh, of each other. So and then as we know that this this these scales could be. Um, um, not, they, they are not one scale per entire weight filters. They, they could be scaled per each like uh, channel, and uh, so then um, it could be like you know every channels can be pruned here in channel pruning techniques, which can end up having a wrong pruning for us based on these scale values. So how to deal with this? It's actually very easy. We know that we can fuse uh, batch norm into our convolution. Basically, at the end of the day, we would have. One convolution layer can do the job of batch norm and convolution because these are uh, all uh, linear uh, operations. They can be easily combined. And then we have basically two layers, fused convolutions, and then we'll go to activation. So then the algorithm will be uh, one level simpler here. Um, now we have um, the teacher will be cloned to students, and now we record the batch norm. And now it's clear why we need to record the batch norm statistic because the next step we're going to fuse batch norm into the con, so then we don't have access to the batch norm. And then we start matching each layer uh, of the compressed or student with the uh, teacher layer. So um, we think. There, there is, there is uh, no problem, and we can train this, but still there is uh, uh, more here to do. Uh, so what? if you look at the layers of a neural network in, um, in, 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 in a sequence, let's, let's look at two layers. Uh, there are some inconsistency uh, between, uh, between the uh, weights in, in two layers. Let's, let's have it like a deeper. Let's just for a simplicity, imagine these are like um, convolutions or like linears, uh, uh, as we assumed before, uh, and see that like you know we have basically layer number i, uh, the, the the weights are applying on the inputs and then biases and then activation and then all everything goes to the layer number two with uh, i plus one and then the biases and then the ReLU. So now let's look at this property of the ReLU. So. Similar to batch norm, what we have is that you know the there could be a scale factor here that if we pass it to the input of the activation and the inverse of that will be on the output, but still the input output remain the same, but we can have like different scale for the input here. So now if I basically apply uh, apply this scale factor in in two layers. Uh, you can see that I can have some arbitrary scale of the weights in uh, layer one that the some other scales in layer two may compensate for that. So then uh, pruning and quantizations here of, of one layer may hugely affect the other layer uh, in, a, in, a, in a wrong way. So let me illustrate this. Uh, so. Um, if you if you, let's see how like the information in one layer is affecting the other one so the uh, re, the red and blue uh, row in the first layers are basically creating the input in the red and blue row uh, of the of the second layer of the input the xi plus 1 and then the column of the 
uh, weights in the layer i plus ones are the one that affecting the corresponding input to that layer. So uh, basically, the row of uh, layer of i are affecting the column on the row of of, of column of uh, i plus layer of i plus one. So now, if I uh, basically let's say the scale um, the uh, row of, of layer i by some arbitrary large value, then um, I divide the column of the um, i plus one by the, uh, the same large value. Now let's let's see what I have here. I have a very small uh, weight on the layer i plus one, so that if I uh, start, let's say, prune the column. So in my pruning technique, I will highly likely to prune the uh, weights on uh, layer i plus one. Uh, what you're seeing in the uh, right here. And now, if I prune that, what's, what is happening, it means that, let's say, in, 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 in that inference, this, this is pruned, this is already zero. It means that uh, the output of this layer, the layer I plus one, uh, will end up basically zeroing out the corresponding uh, element, which we know that this corresponding element was supposed to be coming from the previous layer here, which is supposed to come from this row. So this row contains a lot of information that in practice they have been thrown out and the, the practice they have been useless and we cannot use them. So like, basically what it entails is that the compression technique thinks that these informations have high value and they need to remain. But in practice, when you run the network, uh, this information are not being used. So then you are not doing an optimal uh, um, uh, compression here. So we need to take care of this. So in order to take care of this, we need to basically make sure that there is some sort of layer equalization that across layers, the values are equalized that if we prune a layer, we make sure that all the affecting layers, uh, they also being pruned out uh, uh, equivalently. So uh, we need to bring some sort of like normalization uh, to the game here. So in order to do that, uh, we have a rescaling factor uh, that capture the uh, maximums or the kind of like the average, um, uh, geometric average maximum of the two layers, uh, the corresponding and affecting uh, uh, rows and columns. And then what we do is that in order to make sure that, you know, we have like the same input output for each of those layers, uh, we keep track of uh, the, uh, inputs and output, the, the trace of input and output at, at, uh, at, at these rescaling steps. So we apply basically this rescaling uh, to uh, rows and columns of the uh, corresponding layers. And then what we do is uh, we start also applying the inverse of the rescaling to outputs and inputs of the corresponding uh, uh, layers to each other. So now by this, we make sure that the, in, the, the input and output of each individual uh, layer remains the same. So if basically we are looking at the network in practice, there is, there is no difference. But uh, when uh, we look at the weight values, now they're in different scales. So we repeat this step for all the rows and columns, and also then we repeat for all the neighboring layers uh, to the extent that we see that now the uh, values of S are small enough and there's not much change. So then we can say that, okay, now layers are kind of equalized. And now if we prune um, a, a value in layer I plus one, or if we call quantize, uh, then the uh, values of the previous layers or like the affecting layers are equally pruned or equally quantized in the same bucket. So. With this now, we almost solve like our major problems here. So now the algorithm will be uh, almost complete here. So we have like our um, cloning to, uh, as an initialization. Now we uh, record the batch norm statistic and then we fuse the batch norms into the cons. And now we apply our equalization technique here uh, to equalize each layer. Then with that, we can start uh, uh, sampling the distributions uh, from the batch recorded batch norm status and start training our uh, layer by layer model. So let's see how, how it works in practice. Let's say first, uh, uh, let's see that how it works with a, comp a, a compression based on pruning techniques. So 
Um, one of the state of the art pruning methods or uh, soft threshold weight reparameterization. Uh, it's actually a very um, um, easy to understand technique in terms of its, 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 its uh, uh, this uh, is the uh, new uh, methods and state of the art in unconstrained pruning. Uh, so the, the main idea here is to uh, simply uh, reparameterize the weight during the training by uh, applying a, a, a sigmoid uh, into a sign of the weight with a ReLU function. So imagine this whole S is a zero, then the weight will be basically the same. Uh, there's no change in the weight, but if, if the S has like some high value, we start to see a lot of zero in our weight uh, uh, parameters. So it will be uh, uh, more sparse. So basically increasing the value of S entails more sparsity in our weights. And basically we, uh, we train S and W at the same time here, and then let the network to figure out how much sparsity it requires. And it turns out this method is very effective for pruning and it keeps a lot of, uh, high accuracy while giving a, a higher sparsity rate here. So, uh, when we um, look at this model, um, uh, we, 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 the, what I'm showing here is a, um, a sparsity rate at X axis and uh, an image net top one accuracy at Y axis. And uh, what we expect is that when we have like highest sparsity rate, we want to uh, keep accuracy as high as possible. Uh, so let's uh, look at the curve uh, on the left side. Uh, which we are running this on a mobile net v1, which is kind of already an efficient uh, structure. And then we apply uh, different pruning techniques on this. And these are the pruning techniques that they are not based on a data generation. They're all based on um, the pruning of, of a given model. And um, there are like four, three different models that we compare with as one of them, like a global uh, threshold based uh, uh, pruning, which we have like a, a, a single um, threshold and we globally basically uh, prune uh, the network based on that threshold and we figure out like what is the best threshold there by uh, sweeping. And then uh, the, uh, another one, which is the uniform, which is that per each layer, we have a, uh, a percentage of pruning uh, um, that is fixed for each layer. And then we apply that percentage to uh, uh, to prune those. And then and the last one is a, a another recent work that uh, automatically uh, figure out the percentage of the pruning per each layer separately, uh, based on the size of the layer. And usually these techniques are being applied for uh, uh, when we compress with data. And since again this this topic is like very new, there's not much uh, going on there, and then we just adopt that topic uh, to uh, the, the, this approach to use without data um, compression. And so when we when we show that here, we see that the uh, the layer wise techniques that we are we are building here are are, are, are more effective than than uh, all the others uh, approach. And then we have seen like this same on the efficient net, and efficient net is is a very uh, this is like a very, very efficient network. It's already very compressed, and any compression usually causes a huge drop in accuracy. And, and we see that still, like this layer wise uh, techniques are, are more effective here. Uh, but let's, let's relax the problem a little bit more and uh, look at the, um, the models that can um, actually compress the network with the assumption of uh, generating data. So the, when, when generating data, we have to make assumptions that what are the type of the input. In this case, uh, the assumption is that, okay, we are dealing with the natural images and we can use the, the, uh, the constraint that we have for natural images. Then, then there are like a bunch of techniques uh, such as adversarial knowledge distillation, deep inversion, uh, that they show that you can generate data and then you can um, keep uh, basically generating those data, some sort of like random images, and then you start uh, retraining your model based on those. Uh, then we we are saying that because because those uh, those are th those methods you need to generate a massive set of data. Then you need to pay the cost for training all of those data again in in your uh, system, meaning that. Uh, you know, our layer-wise model 
the training is actually a bunch of small layers and like the, the amount of data that we generate with the small layers are like uh, pretty tiny because we can easily uh, overfit on those and uh, our models are like much much layer wise would be much much more efficient than training an entire network uh, uh, end to end so what we're showing here is that if if we assume that if we have a generated model with the assumption of the input of the data uh, still uh, we may get uh, a higher accuracy uh, in, um, in 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 larger sparsity range but this comes with the cost of up to hundreds of uh, x of more computation and power here yeah. um, uh, and however we are showing that if even we apply the uh, layer wise uh, the constraint on top of the uh, data generation based model still it can help to improve the accuracy but uh, uh, when we are seeing in, 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 in low range of sparsity, we see that uh, the accuracy of the layer voice is still higher than the data generation. But uh, there, are, there is still a gap when we go into the larger sparsity uh, um, domain here. So now let's look at the quantization and effect of like uh, compression based on the quantization techniques here. So um, for the Quantization techniques, uh, we are seeing basically a, a general quantization mechanism where uh, we can quantize weights to um, like arbitrary number of bits here, uh, which is formulated by um, having the lower and higher, highest, lowest and highest value of a weight filter. And then uh, formulation is uh, basically bucketing this to uh, two to the K, uh, two to to the B bit, if the number of bits, for example, is two bits, we have um, four buckets. And if it's eight bits, two to the eight bits, uh, two to the eight buckets are there. And then we want to now quantize each uh, elements in, in, in one of those buckets. Uh, there are like tons of way of um, like optimizing for those. Like initially, when we built XNOR uh, uh, net, we had those optimizations now that you can actually uh, uh, put a mm, mm, sort of like back propagation techniques that can actually train for optimally uh, uh, allocating each weight value to uh, to these uh, buckets while training the neural networks uh, in a, with really good accuracy and uh, we, we can basically adopt the similar techniques here and many other techniques to do that uh, for this now um, basically the uh, the core goal of this optimization here is that uh, we want the output of the quantized layer to be very similar of the output of the unquantized layer by um, optimizing for now figuring out what should be the range of lower bound and higher bound of, of the values uh, and then or, uh, and the quantization buckets here. So there are again different techniques how to like some of them are based on uh, the border between quantization buckets, we want to optimize some of the, we don't want to optimize border of the quantization, uh, and then they, 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 they will entail uh, like different inference engine for quantization as well. Uh, for the sake of simplicity, we assume that fixed border here and just adjusting the highest and lowest uh, value per quantization uh, layer. So when uh, we uh, put this quantization approach on um, different models, we are saying that applying layer voice quantization are showing a much more uh, efficacy on lower bit rates. Uh, on the highest bit rate, we see there's not much difference, and they're almost all uh, works the same. But when we go to lower bit rates, and compare it even with the models that they have assumption with the input data, such as uh, adversarial noise distillation or deep inversion, that they make assumptions and they have with those assumptions, uh, uh, they are um, they are basically retraining and they are they're training the model. Uh, in lower bit, we see that there is a huge huge improvement on 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 layer wise uh, uh, model quantization here. And um, this is this is very interesting in the sense that now these, this is like a kind of like a light uh, light of sight for us that there is our first step toward this that okay we can quantize to a very low bit a neural network 
that uh, that can preserve uh, accuracy and they can give a meaningful accuracy here now because when you're comparing like 18 percent whereas like 0 0.24 here we're talking about random but here you have some meaningful information and as we go higher we see that the accuracy will go higher and now in, in very high bit rate there is not much difference between these techniques um but uh the maybe a question being asked here is that Okay, how about the like going all the way lower to one bit? Yeah, one bit is still we don't have a line of sight here. And it basically shows that, hey, there is still a large room for improvement. And I think uh, there has to be many, uh, I think, uh, efforts here to close this gap. And I think it's super valuable here for all the reasons that I mentioned in earlier in my talk that data free comparisons because of data is not available to us and uh, it cannot be available for privacy reason, for technical reasons. And, uh, and if you are playing the role as a compression, we need to make it easy and accessible for everyone to use. And these are the key uh, problems that we have here. And this is like the very first steps. And I have seen recently a few, uh, a few uh, new papers that's showing up in CVPRs uh, on the zero shot uh neural network compressions or uh, some of those domains uh, so um, i think this is a, a very important um, area that we need to research on and uh, this is you will see more out of this domain and by that i'm finishing my talk i'm, I'm happy to uh, take questions here all right thanks mohammed what a terrific talk. Okay. Uh, first question from the audience goes back to uh, the determination of the student layer. How do you select the size of the student layer? Okay, that's a great question. So the size of the student layer um, by like the structure, it remains um, the same as the teacher layer, I mean by structure. But now when you're talking about per layer, then uh, the size could be arbitrary, meaning that the um, the, the quantization, uh, if, if, if you're doing pruning, uh, it's basically the size will be determined by the pruning algorithm. Sometimes some pruning algorithm, you can uh, give them a fixed ratio for the size, uh, what should be the pruning size, and sometimes you let the pruning algorithm to discover. In the case of softer shielding, uh, the size will be determined during the training of, 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 the, of the network. Basically, it automatically figures out what should be the optimal size. And then, um, as the, I understand this question comes, uh, how can I specify the size in my uh, plots that I showed? Basically, what we do is that we play with the parameters S and we put uh, some constraint there to uh, force it to remain in some specific size and force the network to train S at the specific size. And then with that, we control basically the size of the network. And for quantization, it's easy by controlling the number of bits, we can control the size. OK. All right, next question. Can you comment on software and how do we support for supporting number one, mixed position, and number two, bit position below eight bits? So it's asking for um, software and how do we support for this algorithm? That's a good question. Uh, the answer is yes, and uh, there are multiple ways to have uh, hardware support. Um, so there's, it's easy to say that there is like a one bit hardware support is there. So like the extreme case scenario is there, but I think the main concern is between one and eight bits, for example, four or six bit. Uh, yes, there could be a hardware support, and there will be basically um, the, uh, the approach that uh, imagine that, you know, uh, you are doing a lookup-based quantization that uh, your um, ho your hardware has a, 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 a lookup uh, table that uh, you can have like certain uh, number of the like, quantization bucket and then the hardware basically do the lookup for each quantization bucket. So um, short answer is yes, there are hardware supports, uh, uh, but the long answer would be that how we how this hardware support is being designed. So, but yes, there are hardware support, uh, and it could be it could be actually arbitrary uh, from two bits to eight bits. Right. What about software support? You know, what about compilers? How would the compiler be de developed to support this compression? Uh, there. Uh, so for. Uh, 
software supports compiler support again for one bit they exist and for uh, uh, the uh, bucketing and quantization based on bucketing uh, there is no direct like the, the the open source compiler that does exist right now pytorch and, and tensorflow directly um, we may not be able to have like those compiler support but we can uh, mm -hmm. simulate those compiler support right now that actually actually do the do the task for us um uh, there is there is not like if 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 we need to we need to build the actual compiler support for for this this type of uh quantization uh for pruning they're all there like in the, the, the every size is there but just for quantization for uh arbitrary quantization between eight to one bit uh we need to simulate based on the current pytorch and tensorflow uh, so uh, i wouldn't say that there's like the actual backend compiler support already that everyone can use but there is a simulation that you can use Okay. 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 All right. So another question: Does this technique also apply to transformer-based network, or is it only limited to CNN-based network? That's a good question. Um, so you know, transformer-based, or uh, they don't have. Uh, uh, I mean, apart from the attention layers, it's all very similar. The problem mm -hmm. comes to the attention layers. And the attention layers, we don't have parameters there. There are just operations between uh, two inputs that inputs are attending, either it's a self-attention or attention on different uh, different other inputs. And there, because we don't have parameters, uh, then all the discussion on pruning and quantization will be irrelevant. And we cannot actually discuss about those as, as a challenge. But any other part of it where we have parameters, the same technique can be used. But main uh, like uh, cost or like high compute part of like transformer based are on the attention specifically in the vision domain but in the speech and language domain still the parameters are to play a huge compute role that the same technique can be applied but in vision domain i am afraid that it's, it will not be very effective and it is a very nice domain to research on how to do it data free <laughs> Yeah. Okay. I'll have a. I have a follow up question to that. Just uh, your result is based on mobile net v one. Have you tried this technique on mobile net v two or v three, where bottleneck layers are more prominent? Yeah. Yeah. Um. There are like you know there is a coming paper actually. I think the archive version is up there. Um. They have like a couple of like other different networks with mm -hmm. mobile net v two, ResNet, and a couple of like other network to see the uh, basically effect of those. Yeah, and uh, we see kind of similar behavior in, in all of those. And uh, as, as we get a more and more and more compressed network, we see that the behavior is more tight because the networks are very uh, compressed. Like uh, as an example that I yeah. showed, like Asian net was one of those cases. But yeah. OK. Can you share the URL for that, uh, your paper on this? Sure, definitely. Yeah. Uh, I think the audience is actually said asking uh, sharing the URL of your paper of this interesting work. I'm not Great. sure how you share that uh, right now. Maybe you can. Um, Should I put it here on this slide, or or maybe you can uh, use the chat. I, I, basically, the title is 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 a, if the layer layer wise uh, data free compression is the I think very few that comes in the archive paper that okay all over there. yeah that's the same title. Okay, and uh, I think we have time for one more question. How do you deal with the skip links? Oh, that's a good one. Um, so for the skip links, um, you know, what, what happened is that we basically um, used the uh, batch norm of the layer one layer above, and then uh, we uh, we sample the data and then add with those skip layers. So if like, I think I had one small point here, skip connection. So we basically generate the data separately for that is like you know skip layer, and then we combine the data, and then we start uh, fusing those and training. If you look at this here line, uh, you, you will see that. OK, all right, we have more questions, but uh, we have to end it here. So thank you so much, Mohammed, for this great talk.
Uh, again, just a quick uh, shout out to our sponsors. Bear with me for one minute. We have different categories. We have executive sponsors. First one being ARM. Then we have Qualcomm. We have Samsung. Platinum sponsors. Ada Compute. Lattice Semiconductor. Gold sponsors. Brainchip. Babel Labs. DSP Group. Edge Impulse. Emza, Gray Matter Labs, Green Waves, Hymax, Imagimob, Latent AI, Maxim Integrated, Quixo, Reality AI, Sensi ML, Silicon Labs, Sentient, Google TensorFlow, Xmos, and lastly, silver sponsors, Edge Cortex, Hachi, and Synsense.